back again. We left off at Hode, which means here, H-E-R-E. -E. And we're, this is basically covering 535 and 536 A.D. with Justinian in power. And there are a couple of things before I want to go further with this that I got to cover prior. Nikkei Revolt, 532. Okay, that's 530. This is 531. And it's important that Kai is there. I'll explain that in a minute. Kai Par. Having sort of reached a semi-stage of euphoria right in here, because he's getting so much money due to psychophants over-collecting, taxes and stuff because he's going to revive Rome and that's expensive by 531 there was a significant rebellion not just the greens and the blues but the people who were being taxed and because of all the money he was getting there was a lot of what do you want to call it envy jealousy people who were being ruined had gripes and they started to have conspiracies. So the other function of Kai there, again it's short for Kaiser, there started to be um, attempts to overthrow him, overthrow Justinian. The Nika revolt, which was technically between the blues and the greens, they were upset over a death penalty given to some some um, people who were doing a past revolt, one of whom was blue and one of whom was green. Um, that was just, you know, part of a whole. The whole was is that the people of Constantinople and the environs were upset with all the taxation and upset with the reversion to the Council of Chalcedon even though most of the people in Constantinople were Chalcedonian. They were upset with the way it was being handled. And they wanted a replacement. Okay? That's why in 532, it wasn't simply the blues and the greens revolting and then the two, you know, vehemently opposed teams, because the green were Monophysite and the blue were Chalcedonian. They actually unite in order to overthrow Justinian. So 532 is a low point for him. And that's coming here right at par. Okay? So you got conspiracies building, conflicts building, desire to overthrow him building. And right here at 532, it was so bad because they burnt most of the city. It was so bad that he was despairing of being in power, and that's why his wife's famous speech became, you know, part of history. Because she encouraged him to go back and beat these people. But it wasn't just these people. There were a whole bunch of conspirators trying to post up somebody else to take his place as emperor. So the bloody 30,000 killed that occurs at this point in 532, right at the par. It's real important that it be that word. Um, was just not just putting down the blues and the greens, but it was putting down the conspirators. So this was kind of like the city is burned. It's a bloodbath. Everybody's in revolt. Nobody wants Justinian. And if it weren't for Belisarius coming in at that point, this is how Justinian learns of him. If it weren't for Belisarius and his generalship coming in at that point, Justinian would have lost. He would have either died or he would have left. Now when you have a low point like that and you win, you there's a certain hardness that creeps in. Especially when you're talking about thousands dead and you had to brutally put them down by force. And you start to think about 
you're sort of more grandiose than you were before. And that's why we have to focus on this word parestai. Okay, because it doesn't mean will come. That's the translation you see in the Bible. See, here's Bible Works 5, the earlier version of Bible Works, so it's got a different format. And here's the verb parestai. The actual verb is par me. And it's really important to know the etymology of this. The Bible is very um, precise. And it's very, uh, it's satire is extremely biting. This par, P-A-R, comes from para, which and there is saying near, but that's not, it's not near the way we think of it. Okay, it's, it's got some of that connotation, but what it really means is alongside. Like in John 14, you hear that thing about the Holy Spirit is your teacher. The Greek word for that is para. See, that's the word para right here. Greek word is para. And the actual total Greek word is parakletos. And you'll see it, like in the King James, I think they translate it paraclete because they're transliterating it instead of translating it. And some versions translate it, the Holy Spirit is your helper, which is really stupid. It means your chief advisor, somebody who's always alongside you all the time. And the particular use of that term had to do with a royal advisor always accompanying the ruler everywhere he went, and the ruler would be dependent on that advisor who was always at his side. So it's near in the sense of being at your side, near at hand, always available to be called on, always available to help you in a, in a massive way, in an expert way, in a royal way, really, because that's kind of the meaning here. So when you got the word paraimi, imi means to be. This this part, e i m i, means to be. So literally, it's like alongside to be. So we would translate that in English to be alongside. Okay, it ends up being sort of an idea of, well, he's here, present, alongside you, by you. Okay, so that's why they're saying near and by, but you have to know what kind of, because in English, near and by it has all kinds of different meanings. But it's talking about a person who you're depending on, who's coming. Okay, so here the beast, because it was and is not, is. So we trans we'd reverse that in English and is not, and this is during the time of the, the, the attempted overthrow. Alongside will be. Okay, it will be next. It's coming. It's at hand. It's in your hand. It's nearby. It will be your savior, so to speak. It's got that kind of meaning. It's not to come. It's a different Greek word for to come. The word for come is erkomai. But that's not the word that, that John is using here or the angel is using. It's, it's to will be alongside you. Idea being to help you. Yeah, and the guy alongside to help him was Belisarius. You see the, the wit here? The guy who saves Justinian and essentially Rome from chaos is the para. That means Belisarius. And he will be alongside Justinian. He will be the most loyal guy Justinian ever has. And Justinian's going to spit on him, but not right now. So as a result of Bel Belisarius being alongside him, Justinian gets really confident about the future. He gets really confident about his power, his ability, his everything, because Belisarius is really loyal.
really, really loyal. Okay, and Procopius was the adjunct, the adjutant to Belisarius. Okay, so Procopius, who writes all that nasty stuff, the secret history, is writing it from like inside because he's he's right alongside Belisarius, and Belisarius is right alongside Justinian. Okay, so Justinian starts to think of the beast, the future reviving of Rome that he wants so badly, that he's going to be successful at it. It's next. It's at hand, because I got Belisarius. He's next. He's at hand. I'm going to win. I beat these Nika people. I beat the blues and the greens, and I beat all these people who wanted to take away my crown. And 30,000 of them are dead now, and I'm the victor, and I'm going to win back Rome. That's the psychology. That's what's so important about this word. It tells you the psychology of our prototype Antichrist, who is a real person. Now, if you were a ruler, and you almost died, or you almost lost your head, and some guy comes along with you, and he rescues you, as it were, but you're the emperor. On the one hand, you should be grateful. And on the other hand, you're going to start to get a really big head. All right? And that's why this becomes important. That's 535, 536. Okay? And that brings us back to our timeline, which is very incomplete, but I'm going to try to fill it out. Okay, the next two years, that's the Esti, right here. See, this is 532, 533, 534, will be. So Belisarius will be, see the wit here of the Bible, how precise it is? Belisarius will be winning back Rome for Justinian. It's Belisarius who does this. Genes Justinian, he doesn't go. He's not like the emperors of old that goes with his troops. His general does this. And he does it really well. And Justinian's sitting there in Constantinople congratulating himself. He's getting a really big head about who he is and his role in the world. Now, you've seen Christians do this, so that's why I'm bringing it up again. Because this is part of the problem. Council of Chalcedon. Oh, we're holy if we believe a certain definition of God. And everybody else who doesn't believe that definition, you know, they're, they're see, Council of Chalcedon. That, you click on that link and you'll read all about it. And anybody who doesn't believe in that definition of God, well, they're bad. Well, he starts to think of himself sort of like God here. Because will be, that's, yeah, that's Belisarius who came in alongside and will be conquering Africa, the breadbasket of Western and Eastern Rome. Because that, that included, you know, the, the borderline with Egypt and all that. It's the coastline mostly. But what we call Libya today was a source of olive oil and all kinds of food. And Constantinople was constantly having a problem with food. Okay, and they were going to have more problem with food because of the taxing that they did. And they were going to have even more problem with food because the, the part that they were getting the food from were monophysite. And if you're going to go Council of Chalcedon all holy as if your definition was right and everybody else is a demon, well, then people aren't going to grow food for you. Okay? They aren't. So as far as, as far as this period goes, this is what gives Justinian a big head because of the winning in Africa. It's like Donald Trump when he started winning a couple of things. Oh, I'm the greatest thing since white bread. Nobody can beat me. Everything's great. And he'll even go to the trouble of buying crowds. He's insatiable about that. Well, this is what happened to, to Justinian. Okay. Except Justinian was also really bright, and he had a lot of ideas. He meant well, but at the same time, he's overcome 
by his own success. All right. So by the time you get here, you know, this is when this is when Africa gets conquered by the time of Este. Will be. Will come alongside. Will be. So he's thinking, ah, oh, I'm winning Rome, I'm winning Rome. And instead of doing the smart thing, which, okay, it's 534, you, you've had the Vandal War, you conquered Africa, let's take a little rest, okay, by the end of 534. Oh, no, right away he's got to start reconquering Italy from the Goths. He doesn't know the limits He's already taxed his people. He's already got, the, due to the Nika riots, okay, there was extreme destruction to the city, which is where we're going to go next. And destruction of the people, a lot of depopulation, a lot of death. And it doesn't dawn on him, hey, wait a minute, maybe I should stop with the conquering of Africa. That'll refill the coffers a little bit. I don't have to tax the people. The people are suffering, blah, blah, blah. But he doesn't think like that because he won in Africa. So now we're going to go right away the next year and fight the Goths. Well, it's not so easy to do that because there are a lot of mountains and other things. I mean, Africa is pretty flat. It's not so easy to go running over to Italy, okay? So in 535, 536, he doesn't take a rest. He doesn't read the tea leaves, so to speak. Why did this rebellion occur? Well, maybe because you were handling it wrong? Maybe because you were overtaxing the people? Maybe because they didn't have any food? He doesn't, he doesn't think about what went wrong? Oh, yeah, fine, I go, go to Africa and I'm bringing in food from Africa now. But you're bringing it at the expense of the African people. Although Belisarius did a real good job of, of trying to help them, too. Okay? He's going straight now to Italy because he's God now. He can conquer anything. He's got Belisarius, and it must be because he's such a good person, and he's such a good Christian. See, Council of Chalcedon, Council of Chalcedon, Council of Chalcedon. I'm such a good Christian, I must be winning because God is on my side because I'm picking the right definition of God. He wouldn't know the Bible if it bit him very clearly because he, he could have read this Greek. Why didn't he see himself in it? Okay? He could have counted the syllables that would have been native to him. How come he didn't see himself in it? Oh, but he doesn't. Right straight away to Italy. Because, you know, Council of Chalcedon, I'm aligned with the Pope. I'm on God's side now, and I'm getting all this money, and I'm winning in Africa. So everywhere I go, it's going to keep on winning. Okay? Now, here's the killer. Remember I said Nika Revolt had destroyed most of the city of Constantinople. As a result of that, of course, okay, that's happening here. He sends Belisarius in, off to Africa at the very time he's got to rebuild his own city where he lives. And does it dawn on him, hi, I've already, the, the whole reason this happened in the first place was because I overtaxed people and they don't have any money? No, it doesn't dawn on him. So he embarks on an expensive war to Africa, which, thank God, he did win, because then the people wouldn't have any food otherwise. But at the same time, he's, it's expensive to field an army, especially in those days. I'm going to have to come back because the landscapers there. But just keep that thought in mind. 